Let me explain why Jesus calls himself son of man. Son of man is an Aramaic expression meaning a man, a human being. Son of man means a human being, someone who's human, someone who is man by nature. So Jesus Christ calls himself son of man because he's truly human. He's a man by nature. But he also calls himself son of man for another reason. He also calls himself the son of man for another reason. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So the first reason why Jesus Christ calls himself the son of man, because he's truly human. He's a man by nature. So son of man refers to his humanity, that he's truly human and identifies with the human race because he's part of us. He became one of us, right? That's okay. You can go to CP. God bless you. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Now notice Daniel, the prophet over 600 years before the birth of Christ sees someone who looks like a human being, a son of man, and he's riding the clouds of heaven and he comes to the ancient of days. Now let's read what he says about the son of man. And there was given him dominion. This son of man came to the ancient of days and was given him dominion, the power to rule and glory and a kingdom. That all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Did you catch it? Daniel sees a human figure who's more than human. A human figure, a son of man with coming on the clouds. This human figure approaches the Ancient of Days, which in the New Testament would be God the Father. And when he approaches God the Father, he's given a kingdom that's indestructible. He's an eternal king who rules forever over an indestructible kingdom. And all nations and languages and peoples must worship, serve him. Did you catch it? Do you see what Daniel saw by the power of the Holy Spirit? A son of man, a human figure who rides the clouds, who rules forever, whose kingdom is indestructible, and whom all nations must worship and serve. In other words, this son of man, this son of man is not an ordinary human being. Though human, he's more than human. He's fully divine. He's God in human appearance, God in human form, God in human flesh. How do I know he's God in human flesh? Because all nations worship him the way they worship God. He rides the clouds, which is something only God does, and he rules forever over all nations. Did you catch it? And I'm going to prove to you. The Son of Man is God in human form, distinct from the Ancient of Days, so that's two divine persons. The Ancient of Days, who's God the Father, the Son of Man, who's also God, one with the Father, but personally distinct. How do I know the Son of Man is not just human, but more than human? Okay, let's read Daniel 7, 14 one more time. And I'm going to show you this is who Jesus claims to be. Let me know if you're following me, and I'm not confusing you. Yes, Solomon, persuade. Praise God. You got it, Solomon. Jesus claims to be the son of man that Daniel saw, not just an ordinary son of man. That son of man that Daniel saw, that's God in the flesh. That's who Jesus claimed to be. Now, let me prove to you this son of man, this son of man, and only this son of man is God in the flesh. And there was given him dominion, glory, and kingdom, that all people, nations, language should serve him, the Aramaic verb pilach, which is worship given to God alone, his dominion is the everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. So he is served, Pilach, Aramaic, because this portion is in Aramaic, worshipped by all peoples and nations forever, and he reigns forever. Let's go to Daniel 7, 27. That same verb, serve, is used for the Most High. Daniel 7, 27. Daniel 7, 27. No, he's not Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a picture of Jesus. But anyway, Daniel 7, 27, let's read. This son of man who rides the clouds is served, worshiped by all nations forever, as he reigns over all nations forever. Guys, read Daniel 7, 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, meaning us believers whose kingdom and his everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Did you catch it? The most high is God almighty. 
All dominions shall serve and obey the Most High. All dominions shall worship the Most High. It's the same verb. So let me ask you guys a question. How can the Son of Man be served, worshipped by all nations in the same way that all dominions serve, worship the Most High if the Son of Man is not God? Because it's the same verb. All dominions will serve the Most High. All nations will serve the Son of Man forever. How can the Son of Man be served by all nations forever in the same way that the Most High is served when that kind of service can only be given to God? What does this tell us about the Son of Man? So if the Son of Man will, is receiving the same service by all nations forever that the Most High receives, and only the Most High can be served in that manner, not a creature, because that would be idolatry. What does this tell us about the Son of Man? What does this tell us about the Son of Man? What is the implication? Let me see if you guys are getting it. How can the Son of Man be given the same service that the Most High received from all nations forever? Come on, guys. Let's see how many of you get it. You got it, Boaz. Descent and test the spirits. The Son of Man is not a creature. He's God in human form, in human appearance, in human flesh. You got it. The second line of evidence proving the Son of Man is God. Let's go to Daniel 7.13. You got it, 16.11, Daniel 7.13. And then I'm going to show you that Jesus claims to be that son of man. God bless you too, Alex. Jesus claims to be that son of man. Okay. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man come with the clouds of heaven. Pay attention. The son of man rides the clouds of heaven. Clouds of heaven. No one but God Almighty... In the Old Testament, rides the clouds of heaven. Did you know that? Even in the ancient Near Eastern peoples, the pagan nations surrounding Israel, they too believed and affirmed that only gods ride clouds. In other words, in the ancient Near Eastern civilization, the pagan nations surrounding Israel, they too viewed writing the clouds as a divine function, something that only divine beings did. According to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, Jehovah and Jehovah alone rides the clouds of heaven. But catch Daniel 7.13, folks. Daniel 7.13. It says, it says that the Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven. Now let me prove to you the writing of the clouds of heaven is a divine function that the Old Testament says only God does. Are you ready? Are you ready for that proof? The second line of evidence? The Son of Man rides on the clouds of heaven with the clouds of heaven. Therefore, he must be God because that's something only God does. Are you ready for the evidence? Nahum, the book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. The book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. Exactly, Boaz. That's exactly why they tore their, because they knew who he was claiming to be, God in the flesh. And now watch here. Read Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 for me. He's going to post it. Thank our brother Orbiter. Lord bless you, brother. Okay. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Jehovah rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Did you guys catch it? Jehovah rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Now let's go to Isaiah 19 verse 1. Isaiah 19 verse 1. Watch here. Isaiah 19, verse 1. Now watch here. Who rides the cloud? Who comes on a cloud? Who descends in a cloud? Isaiah 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, Jehovah the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud. 
and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Now let's go to Psalm 104.3. Psalm 104.3. That's Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, Rambos. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, and earlier we quoted Nahum. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3. Now we're going to Psalm 104, verse 3. I hope this is blessing you folks. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot. Jehovah makes the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. So the clouds are the chariot of Jehovah. Jehovah comes in a swift cloud. The clouds are the dust of Jehovah's feet. Psalm 68, verse 4. Psalm 68, verse 4. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. He rides the heavens. He rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He comes in a cloud. You guys catch it? I think I've given you enough proof that God and God alone, Jehovah rides the clouds of heaven and not a creature. So now let me ask you a question. How can the Son of Man... Ride the clouds of heaven, which is a divine function. Even the pagans knew this, right? If he's not God. How can the Son of Man be served with the same type of service given to the Most High by all nations forever if he's not God? What does this tell us about the Son of Man in Daniel? This figure that Daniel saw, who is he? He's not a creature. He's God in the flesh, isn't he? Could Daniel be any clearer in indicating that this Son of Man is more than human, he's God in the flesh and human appearance, and yet at the same time, Daniel saw another divine figure, the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. So Daniel, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, saw two divine persons. The Ancient of Days, whom the New Testament says is God the Father, and the Son of Man, whom the New Testament identifies as Jesus Christ. Is that clear? So why did Jesus Christ claim to be the Son of Man? To show that he's truly human. He's one of us, became part of us, but he's also God in human flesh, the one that Daniel saw. Now let's prove it, that Jesus is claiming to be the Son of Man that Daniel saw. Mark 14, 61 and 62. Mark 14, 61 and 62. Fourteen, sixty-one, and sixty-two. Let's see who Jesus claims to be. Watch here. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, "Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed?" Now notice who Jesus claims to be. And Jesus said, "I am." And ye shall see the Son of Man. Sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Bam. Did you catch it? Jesus says, I am the Christ, the Son of God, and you will see the Son of Man, me, me, the Son of Man, sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus just took Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and applied it to himself. He just identified himself as the Son of Man that Daniel saw. Did you catch it? Now let's go to Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Let's see who Jesus claimed to be. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. It's going to get more amazing. Just be, bear with me. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Pay attention. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking here. Notice who he claims to be. When the Son of Man come in his glory. Remember the Son of Man Daniel was given glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Did you catch it? Jesus claims to be the Son of Man who comes in glory with the angels. And has a glorious throne that he sits upon. And before him the Son of Man shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd. Divideth his sheep from the goats, 
and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats, <clears throat> you skip the part, on the left, you skip the part, but it's okay. Verse 33, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now watch what Jesus says. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye, blessed of my father. Did you catch it? Jesus just said, he's the son of man who sits on a throne of glory, a glorious throne. When he comes with the angels to gather all the nations before him, and he will judge all the nations. And then he claims that he is the king who will say to the righteous on his right, <clears throat> enter into the kingdom, you blessed of my father. So did you catch it? Jesus is the son of man. God is his father. He is the king who sits on a throne of glory, who comes with his angels, and all the nations will be gathered before him as he determines where they will spend the rest of eternity. You see who Jesus claimed to be? The son of man who comes in his glory with the holy angels, who sits on a throne of glory, who gathers all the nations before him, separates the righteous from the wicked, places the righteous on the right, the wicked on the left, and then calls himself the king, who will tell the righteous, receive the kingdom, you blessed of my father. So he is the son of God, who is the son of man. My father, God is my father, meaning he's the son of God, who is the son of man, who sits on a throne of glory, who comes in glory with his angels to judge all nations. Could Jesus be any clearer as to who he is? That son of man that Daniel saw, right? And how does he end this parable? Let's look at Matthew 26, verses 1 to 2. And then they call him Lord in the parable. Matthew 26, verse 1 to 2. Matthew 26, verses 1 to 2. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things saying, he said unto his disciples, we know that after two days of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed and to be crucified. Did you catch it? Notice who he is. He's the Son of Man who will be crucified. And yet he's also the Son of Man who will come in his glory with the holy angels to sit on his glorious throne, throne of glory, to gather all the nations, separating the righteous from the wicked, the righteous on his right, the wicked on his left, who calls himself the king and calls God my father. So Jesus is the son of man who's the son of God and the son of man who will be crucified and killed, buried, raised on the third day. That son of man who will come with his angels to sit on the throne of glory, manifest his glory to the nations, who is the king of the nations who determines their eternal destiny. Is it clear? Jesus died as the God-man, the one person who got, died as God in the flesh. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Is that clear? That Jesus is the son of man of Daniel, but he's also the son of man who will be killed. So it's not two different sons of men. It's one son of man. Jesus is that son of man who will be crucified, killed, buried, raised to life. And that same son of man who comes in his glory with his holy angels to sit on his glorious throne to determine the destiny of everyone. Luke 17, 24 to 25. Luke 17, 24 to 25. This took a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. I hope it's still blessing you and you're learning and benefiting from it. Luke 17, 24 to 25. Jesus again speaking. Who does Jesus claim to be? Luke 17, 24 to 25. Okay, Jesus speaking, notice what Jesus says. For as the lightning that lighteth, lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So he's talking about his coming. It will be so clear when the Son of Man comes, when I, the Son of Man, come in my day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this gener generation. Did you catch it? Who's the Son of Man? The one who will come manifesting his presence so that the whole world will see it will be apparent to everyone like lightning is apparent but first this son of man must be rejected so do you see how jesus christ our lord claims to be 
that son of man of Daniel who comes in glory on the clouds of heaven and whom all nations are subject to. And he's the king of all nations who determines where they will live forever and whom all nations must serve and worship the way they worship God. That he's that son of man because that's the same son of man who is rejected by that generation. That same son of man who will be killed by that generation. That same son of man who will be crucified by that generation. Buried and then come to life. Do you see it? Is that clear? Now let's go to Matthew 16, 21. And then 27. Matthew 16, 21 and 27. Watch here. Lord bless you. Miss SVP1. Amen, amen, amen in Jesus' name. For my children and I. Okay. Okay, now Matthew 16, 21 and 27. Watch what happens here. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So he's going to explain that he's going to be killed. Peter gets scandalized by it. Now notice 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Did you catch it? Who is the Son of Man? He's the Son of God. Because the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father. So God is the Father of the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the Son of God the Father. So when he says the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, Jesus is saying, I'm that Son of Man. I'm the Son of Man who comes in the glory of my Father. So the Son of Man is the Son of God with his angels. Wow. Jesus is not just the Son of Man, and God is not just his Father, but the angels belong to him. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he, the Son of Man, who is the Son of God, shall reward every man according to his works. Did you catch it? So who's the Son of Man who's going to come in the glory of God the Father? To judge every man and repay every man for what he or she has done? Who's that Son of Man? The Son of God. And who's the Son of God? Jesus Christ. So you see why now Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man? Because he's truly human, because to be a Son of Man means you're human. But he's also identifying himself as that Son of Man that the prophet Daniel saw by the Spirit. That Son of Man who's God in human form, God in flesh. That Son of Man who comes with the clouds of heaven, who rules all nations forever because he's an eternal king. And whom all nations are subject to and must serve and worship the way they worship God. That's who Jesus claims to be. Gerson, please don't comment. Jesus, the God-man, died. As God, he died in the flesh. The God-man died because death doesn't mean that Jesus ceased to exist. So don't fall for the trap saying, oh, the man part died. No, the God-man, that one person who's God and man, God in the flesh died. God died a human death without ceasing to exist. Anyway, just let's focus on this. Everyone with me so far? Now let me put the icing on the cake. Let's read Matthew 16, 27 and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. I want to see if you catch who Jesus claims to be. Matthew 16, 27 and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. So Gerson, don't fall for the trap of the Jehovah's Witnesses Muslims saying, oh, the man part died, because they're setting you up. Just say the God-man died. That one person who's truly God, truly human, two natures, one person, the God-man died. God the Son experienced human death without ceasing to exist, because they're defining death to mean ceasing to exist. Who told you that's the definition of death? When you die, you don't cease to exist. Humans, when they physically die, their spirits leave their bodies, and they continue to exist consciously as disembodied spirits, spirits without bodies, but they're still consciously alive.
But anyway, Matthew 16, 27, Isaiah 40, verse 10. Let's read it, folks. Everyone read it. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, shall come in the glory of his Father, so God the Father, God is the Father of the Son of Man, showing it's Jesus the Son of God, with his angels. Now notice what Jesus says he'll do when he comes. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. So Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, comes with the angels, his angels, to reward, repay every man according to his works. Now read that in light of Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God, the Lord Jehovah, will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for, for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Did you catch it? Isaiah 40 verse 10 says, Jehovah God is coming to reward and repay people. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, I am the son of man who is the son of God who comes with my angels to reward and repay everyone according to what he or she has done. Why is Jesus ascribing what Isaiah attributed to Jehovah and applying it to himself. Isaiah said, Jehovah's coming to reward people. Jesus says, I'm the one coming to reward people. Why did Jesus take what Isaiah said about Jehovah and apply it to himself, the Son of God? Why did he do that? Why did he do that? Can you explain to me why Jesus would take what Isaiah said about Jehovah? Jehovah's coming to reward people and say, I'm the one who's the son of man. God is my father. And I'm coming with my angels to reward people. You got it. Descent, test, and Boaz, because he is God. He is of the father, Yah. And he shares the essence of Yah, his father. And Boaz said it, he's God. You got it. So do you see why Jesus Christ claimed to be the son of man? God bless you too, born again. Thank you, Solomon, per side. You got it. Jesus is claiming to be the God of Isaiah, the God that Isaiah saw. Gerson, you got it. God bless you guys. And praise the Holy Spirit and thank the Holy Spirit for enabling you to understand. Amazing, right? So the Son of Man does refer to the fact that Jesus is truly human, but it also identifies himself as the God-Man, God who became flesh, the God-Man that Daniel saw. It's one of the most powerful testimonies to his deity, that he's God in the flesh.